Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling bright and blessed in Jesus this day. Now, we are continuing our study on humility, which is the journey toward holiness written by Andrew Murray. Now, today we are in chapter 2, and the title of this chapter is Humility, the Secret of Redemption. Thomas Aquinas once said, if you're looking for an example of humility, look to the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9 read, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. No tree can grow except on the root from which it sprang. Through all its existence, it can only live by the life that was in the seed that gave it being. The full apprehension of this truth in its application to the first and second Adam cannot but help us to understand both the need and the nature of the redemption that is in Jesus. When the old serpent who had been cast out of heaven for his pride, whose whole nature was pride, spoke temptation into Eve's ear, those words carried with them the very poison of hell. And when she listened and yielded her desire and her will to the prospect of being like God, knowing good and evil, the poison entered into her soul, destroying forever that blessed humility and dependence upon God that would have been our everlasting inheritance and happiness. Her life and the life of the race that sprang from her became corrupted to its very root with that most terrible of all sins and curses, Satan's pride. All the wretchedness of which this world has been the scene all its wars and bloodshed among the nations, all its selfishness and suffering, all its vain ambitions and jealousies, all its broken hearts and embittered lives, with all its daily unhappiness, they all have their origin in what this cursed pride, our own or that of others, has brought upon us. It is pride that made redemption necessary. It is from our pride that we need, above everything else, to be redeemed, and our insight into the need of redemption will largely depend upon our knowledge of the terrible nature of the power of pride that has entered into our being. As we have said, no tree can grow except on the root from which it sprang. The pride that Satan brought from hell and whispered into the life of humankind is working daily, hourly, and with mighty power throughout the world. Men and women suffer from it. They fear and fight and flee it. And yet they don't always know where it has come from or how it has gained such terrible supremacy. No wonder they don't know how to overcome it. Pride has its root and strength in a spiritual power, outside of us as well as within us. As needful as it is that we confess and deplore it, it is satanic in origin. If this leads us to utter despair of ever conquering or casting it out, it will lead us all the sooner to that supernatural power in which alone our deliverance is to be found, the redemption of the Lamb of God. The hopeless struggle against the working of self and pride within us may indeed become still more hopeless as we think of the power of darkness behind it. The utter despair will fit us better for realizing and accepting a power and a life outside of ourselves, the humility of heaven brought down by the Lamb of God to cast out Satan and his pride. Even as we need to look to the first Adam and his failure to know the power of sin within us, 
we need to know the second Adam and his power to give us the life of humility as real and abiding and enabling as was the life of pride. We have our life from and in Jesus Christ, even more certainly than from and in Adam. We are to walk rooted in him, holding fast the head from which the whole body increases with the increase of God. The life of God that entered human nature through the incarnation is the root in which we are to stand and grow. It is the same almighty power that worked there at the cross and onward to the resurrection. It is that power which works daily within us. It is of utmost importance that we study to know and trust the life that has been revealed in Christ as the life that is now ours and waits for our consent to gain possession and mastery of our whole being. In view of this, it is important that we know who Christ is, especially his chief characteristic that is the root and essence of his character as our Redeemer. There can be but one answer. It is his humility. What is the incarnation but his heavenly humility? his emptying himself and becoming man. What is his life on earth but humility, his taking the form of a servant? And what is his atonement but humility? He humbled himself and became obedient to death. And what is his ascension in his glory but humility exalted to the throne and crowned with glory? He humbled himself. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place in heaven where he was one with the Father in his birth, his life, and his death on earth. In his return to the right hand of the Father, it is all humility. Christ is the expression of the humility of God embodied in human nature. The eternal love humbling itself, clothing itself in the garb of meekness and gentleness to win and serve and save us. As the love and condescension of God makes him the benefactor and helper and servant of all, so Jesus of necessity was the incarnate humility. And so he is still in the midst of the throne, the meek and lowly lamb of God. If this is the root of the tree, its nature must be seen in every branch and leaf and fruit. If humility is the first, the all-inclusive grace of the life of Jesus, if humility is the secret of his atonement, then the health and strength of our spiritual life will depend entirely upon our putting this grace first and making humility the chief quality we admire in him, the chief attribute we ask of him, the one thing for which we sacrifice all else. Is it any wonder that the Christian life is so often weak and fruitless when the very root of the Christian life is neglected or unknown? Is it any wonder that the joy of salvation is so little felt when that by which Christ brings it is so seldom sought until a humility that rests in nothing less than the end and death of self and which gives up all the honor of men as Jesus did to seek the honor that comes from God alone which absolutely makes and counts itself nothing. It is then that God may be all, that the Lord alone may be exalted. Until such a humility is what we seek in Christ above our chief joy and welcome at any price, there is very little hope of a faith that will conquer the world. I cannot too greatly impress upon you the need of realizing the lack there is today of humility within Christian circles. There is so little of the meek and lowly Lamb of God in those who are called by his name that we should consider how our lack of love, indifference to the needs and feelings of others, even sharp comments and hasty judgments that are often excused as being honest and straightforward, how these things are thwarting the effect of the influence of the Holy Spirit upon others. Manifestations of temper, and touchiness and irritation, feelings of bitterness and estrangement. They have their root in nothing but pride. Pride creeps in almost everywhere, and the assemblies of the saints 
are no exception. Let's ask ourselves, what would be the effect if all of us were guided by the humility of Jesus? That the cry of our whole heart, night and day, would be, Oh, for the humility of Jesus in myself and all around me. Let us honestly fix our heart on our lack of humility, that which has been revealed in the likeness of Christ's life, in the whole character of his redemption, and realize how little we know of Christ and his salvation. Study the humility of Jesus. This is the secret, the hidden root of redemption. Believe with your whole heart that Christ, whom God has given you, will enter in to dwell and work within you and make you what the Father would have you to be. Chapter 3, which is entitled, Humility in the Life of Jesus. F.B. Meyer said, The only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. Luke twenty two twenty seven tells us, I am among you as one who serves. In the Gospel of John, we have the inner life of our Lord laid open before us. Jesus spoke frequently of his relationship to the Father, of the motives by which he was guided, of his consciousness of the power and spirit in which he acted. We have already said that this virtue is nothing but the simple consent of the creature to let God be all, the surrender of itself to his working alone. In Jesus, we see how both as the Son of God in heaven and the Son of Man on earth, he took the place of entire subordination, and he gave God the Father the honor and glory due unto him. What he taught so often was true of himself. He says in Luke 18, verse 14, He who humbles himself will be exalted. As it is written, He humbled himself. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Listen to the words our Lord speaks of his relationship to the Father and see how consistently he uses the words not and nothing of himself. The not I that Paul uses to express his relationship to Christ is in the same spirit that Christ speaks of his relationship to the Father. In John 5, 19, he says the Son can do nothing by himself. In John chapter 5, verse 30, he says, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. In John 5, 41, he says, I do not accept praise from men. In John 6, 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will. John 7, 16, he says, My teaching is not my own. John 7, 28, I am not here on my own. John 8, 28, I do nothing on my own. John 8, 42, I have not come on my own, but he sent me. John 8, 50, I am not seeking glory for myself. John 14, 10, the words that I say to you are not just my own. And John 14, 24, these words you hear are not my own. These words of testimony spoken by the Lord himself reveal the deepest motivation of his life and his work. They show how the Father was able to work his redemption through the Son. They show the state of heart that became him as the son of the Father. They teach us the essential nature and life of the redemption that Christ accomplished and now communicates to us. It is this, friend. He was nothing that God might be all. He resigned himself to the Father's will and power that he might work through him. Of his own power, his own will, his own glory, his whole mission with its works and teaching. Of all this, he said, I am nothing. I have given myself to the Father to work. He is all. This life of entire self-abnegation, of absolute submission and dependence upon the Father's will, Christ found to be the source of perfect joy and peace. He lost nothing by giving all to God. 
God honored his trust and did all for him, and then exalted him to his own right hand in glory. And because Christ humbled himself before God, and God was ever before him, he found it possible to humble himself before men as well, and to be the servant of all. His humility was simply the surrender of himself to God to allow him to do in him what he pleased, regardless of what men might say of him or do to him. It is in this state of mind, in this spirit and disposition, that the redemption of Jesus has its virtue and efficacy. It is to bring us to this disposition that we are made partakers of Christ. This is the true self-denial to which our Savior calls us, the acknowledgement that self has nothing good in it, except as an empty vessel for God to fill. Its claim to be or do anything may not for a moment be allowed. It is in this, above and before everything, that the conformity to Jesus consists. The being and doing nothing of ourselves that God may be all in all. Here we have the nature of true humility. It is because this is not understood or sought after that our humility is so superficial and weak. We must learn of Jesus, how he is meek and lowly of heart. He teaches us where true humility begins and finds its strength in the knowledge that it is God who works all in all that our place is to yield to him in perfect resignation and dependence, in full consent to be and to do nothing of ourselves. This is the life Christ came to reveal and to impart, a life to God that came through death to sin and self. If we feel that this life is too high for us and beyond our reach, it must all the more urge us to seek it in him. It is the indwelling Christ who will live this life in us. If we long for it, let us above everything seek the secret of the knowledge of the nature of God, the secret of which every child of God is to be a witness, nothing but a vessel, a channel through which the living God can manifest the riches of his wisdom, his power, and his goodness. The root of all virtue and grace of all faith and acceptable worship is that we know that we have nothing but what we receive. And then we bow in deepest humility to wait upon God for it. It was because this humility was not only a temporary sentiment awakened in him when he thought of God, but also was the spirit of his whole life. That Jesus was as humble in his relationship with men and women as he was with God. He felt himself to be the servant of God for those whom God created and loved. As a natural consequence, he counted himself the servant of men and women so that through him, God might do his work of love. He never for a moment sought his own honor. He never asserted his own power. He never vindicated himself. His whole spirit was that of a life yielded to God. When we study the humility of Jesus as the very essence of his redemption, as the blessedness of the life of the Son of God, and as the virtue Jesus gives us, if we are to have any part with him, we will begin to comprehend how serious it is to lack humility in our lives. So let me ask you, are you clothed with humility? Look at your daily life. Ask your friends about it. Begin to praise God that there is open to you in Jesus a heavenly humility that you have hardly known and through which a heavenly blessedness you have never tasted can come. And that brings us to an end today, friend. The words on these pages cannot fully illustrate to us. We cannot fully comprehend them enough. And so I invite you, I encourage you to go back and listen to this again, and maybe even again, allow these words to penetrate your soul until you begin to see what the true picture of humility is 
how you lack it, and why you need it. For as we are told in the book of James, be not simply hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. I pray that you will humble yourself before the mighty hand of God so that in due time, he will exalt you. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. May the Lord Jesus bless you and keep you. And I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.